Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 386. Science Faction, I call BS. You know, we really don't have to, you know, kick the gimp right now. I mean, Dr. Troy probably has a lot more he wanted to say from last week's episode. He probably could just continue his lecture. I do love coming on to talk about physics, but another reason I come on is to beat you down. Dave. Yeah! You never played team sports growing up, and this is your football. This is your going to state right and, now. And I accidentally used the Ivan Drago Rocky IV joke last week, but this is really where I must break. <laughs> yes. And again, you cannot break the willing. Break away, as I say with my – let me take the ball gag out of my mouth. Break away. And speaking it's, of giving oh. somebody some CTE through some football, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist, Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. I don't like how you stole Valor there. You did not play football. You got your CTE through boxing. That's, Completely different. No, my, what I mean is the CTE that Dr. Troy is going to give you when he's demolishing you and I call BS. If he dies, he dies. <laughs> <laughs> Another uh, Rocky IV joke, by the way. Uh, also, Dolph Lundgren, the guy who yes. plays that dude, yeah. is actually like a chemical engineering from PhD MIT. From MIT. Rhodes like, Scholar. What a badass. Yeah. yeah, he left MIT's PhD program as a Rhodes Scholar fully paid for to do that movie. You know what? If someone offers me movie roles, I might <laughs> abandon science. Well, how good's your kickboxing? <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, I'm not as buff as him. And somebody who is very humble about his buffness, our science guest host for the afternoon, Dr. Troy. Dr. Troy, how you doing? Scientists are generally forced to be humble about yes. our buffness because we <laughs> lack it. <laughs> You're just in a different weight class. You know, I, I can see you have a, a more of a Conor McGregor build. That's right. There should be nerd classes, like <laughs> the first to break the other's glasses. And unlike Greg Hardy, they allow them to use inhalers. All right, let's move right on to I Call BS. I Call I Call I Call I Call I Call, I call. Ring Ring I Call BS. All right, I call BS to the game where I read four science news articles, some of which are real and some of which are BS standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Yeah, whatever. Just make it quick, Dr. Troy. Please, don't. no kissing on the lips. All right, article number one. New research confirms that taking an ice bath after an intense workout helps the body build more muscle more quickly. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, and this is why polar bears are so fucking buff and strong. Because? Because, because you know, they pick up a walrus. Uh-huh. Like that. They, they bench sure. press a walrus. Sure. They, go, they do take the polar bear plunge. Uh-huh. And then the cold water makes their muscles yeah. stronger. Extrapolate that to Scandinavians. They do a lot of that ice jumping. That and is look at, true. Look at the mountain. Be, okay, fair enough. You know what? You've made a good scientific point. All right, Dr. Troy? Well, polar bears, for one, are fucking terrified yep. at times. Largest like, land yeah. carnivore on Earth. Yeah. Like, if you're in the Antarctic, they say... You see a polar bear, yep. like it will eat you. You need to get away from there. Well, especially there, because you're like, how the fuck did the polar bear get here to the Antarctic? These things live on the other side of the globe. <laughs> also, random factoid, the polar bear's liver has such a high concentration of vitamin A, which has to do with it living in a cold climate, <laughs> that there are you will get sick if you eat it. You get really? an overdose of vitamin A, and there are accounts of explorers in the Arctic eating it and getting sick, and now we know the mechanism for it. I know it. how that feels. Every once in a while, you know, you go out to the club, you see some girl there in a short skirt, you get an overdose of vitamin A. You know what I'm talking about, Damien? <laughs> no, I don't. Oh, okay. It was a, Please, can you explain joke. that? To, oh, I see. She gets an overdose of vitamin D. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Strong bones! All right, so getting to the actual science now. I haven't seen this article. This sounds like... The kind of thing. So I'm thinking I'm a basketball fan. Mm-hmm. I know that basketball players often take ice baths afterwards or wraps with ice and they have millions of dollars and access to the best research for, you know, what can maximize their athletic output. So I would hope that they're not doing some stupid folk medicine thing that's actively bad and thus taking an ice bath after mm-hmm. rigorous exercise would actually help you. Although you said for muscular Development, yes. did you? Okay, so maybe... Build, in, build more muscle more quickly. Okay, so it could be that it helps with fatigue and um, not necessarily building muscle, but just not getting worn out enough. You know, these are... I kind of have to guess because I don't know the mechanisms, but I mean, it seems plausible. I'm going to say science. Article number two. Startling new research indicates that the South Atlantic humpback whale populations are now at the lowest point in recorded history and are nearing extinction. Damien, is this science... Or bad science. Seeing as though we're going through an extinction event right now, this seems very plausible. 
Fun fact, did you know that the humpback whale got its name after a randy British scientist in the 1800s thought he would hump this whale, and the whale humped him back. Really? Yeah, sh- da- wrecked him, damn near killed him. <laughs> I I heard it was just because they he actually bought the rights off Disney when they purchased the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Like the the Humpback <laughs> Whale was like Hunchback, Humpback. These are very close. We can get some brand recognition if we cross promote. They're both very good scientific answers. Let's just go with science. <laughs> All right, and Dr. Troy. This certainly sounds very believable. I mean, we're fucking up the planet quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would imagine that whales are starting to go more extinct. I think I've heard about. Blue whale populations in particular dropping. I have no idea if this extends to the humpback whales or anything. So, I mean, I'll just guess science because, sure, humans are fucking things up. All Wait, right. Question that might that will change my answer. In this article, did these humpback whales learn to consume and derive nourishment from plastics? Ooh, that would make them way better, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, Damien. Not okay, yet. Okay, well, then I stick with my original answer. Lazy that whales. is actually, like, w- maybe eventually, if yeah. there's enough plastic polluting the sea, they evolve some weird microbiome yes. that they get bacteria that can There's already bacteria the that are able to t- break down yeah. certain types of plastic. So maybe the bacteria breaks it down and into something they can eat, and yeah. In the same way that cows, you know, they can't digest yeah. grass, but they eat the grass and let bacteria do it. So, hey, you know, Damien, that's a good uh, hypothesis. I need to start eating plastic. I will clean the earth. <laughs> Article number three, a new paper suggests that a potential Alzheimer's medicine found to be ineffective in clinical trials earlier this year is actually quite effective at delaying the onset of Alzheimer's. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. This was an Alzheimer's drug, but they found that it worked on preventing another disease that we talked about on the show quite unexpectedly, adult onset dwarfism. (laughs) This is when an adult, a regular adult, suddenly shrinks to a small size. Spontaneously and quite painfully. Yes. Changes the, their limb length, and this body medicine, proportions. This medicine essentially made that a zero yeah. percent. Like it seemed to make it so that there was zero adult onset dwarfism. Call me crazy, but I'm going to go ahead and guess that not one person who was given this medicine uh-huh. contracted adult onset dwarfism. You're crazy, but that's still true. The technical term for that syndrome is Willy Wonkitis. <laughs> <laughs> I've been Oompa Loompa. <laughs> uh, that is absolutely untrue. Obviously, Dr. Troy is messing around about Rick Moranitis. That is it's a oh. totally different disease. I do actually get that reference. <laughs> All right. And Dr. Troy. So if earlier this year, this drug was sort of thought to not help. Mm -hmm. And now a new paper comes out saying, oh, actually it does. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that happens in science kind of regularly. And I also think it would be much less of a story if it's actually, oh, guess what? This thing they said didn't work. It still Still doesn't work. work. Yeah. So you could have changed the disease. It might not be Alzheimer's. I haven't seen the article, but I'm going to say science. All right. Good reasoning. Lastly, article number four, a new review of the literature concludes that taking the birth control pill as a teenager dramatically increases depression rates later in life. Damien, is this science or bad science? Though I could see an argument for women who uh, took the birth control pill for most of their life, now are ready to have a kid, find out they're infertile. Now they're depressed because they realize maybe I should have been pregnant at 17 because Mm -hmm. now I'm so lonely. However, going to go bad science. Okay. uh, Because I'm going to assume that... The excitement you feel at 25 not having a kid Uh outweighs the depression at 40. That would outweigh it. All right, and Dr. Troy. I could see this going either way. Um, So one thing I know is that there's this syndrome called vestibulodynia, uh, which is basically you have horrible vaginal pain and you Mm. like can't have sex regularly or anything and there aren't good treatments for it because our medical system – Spends a lot of money on dick pills for mm-hmm. dudes who can't get it up, but so not If your so much. dick was in pain, we could help you. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, but a woman with issues, oh, that's yeah, not worth our uh, research funding. And I believe like taking hormonal birth control can lead to, in some women, this syndrome developing, which would certainly make you more depressed later in life if true. you're fucked up in that way. But I also know the pill can do some good things like – you don't have uh, as bad acne and mm-hmm. your cycle becomes more regular. Yeah. And these are People things, with cramps issues and stuff like that. Yeah, and these are things that could maybe help you get through those stressful teenage years of puberty and maybe are less prone to have depression. So, you know, it could go either way. I, my guess would be that because the pill is generally recognized as safe, it would be more of a news story if we're now starting to realize actually – it, it kind of makes you more likely to be depressed later in life. So mm-hmm. maybe consider other alternatives like copper IUDs or non-hormonal things. Pulling out. Well, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't do that. That's, what am I, a madman? I'm not yeah. going to wear a condom. You think yeah. I'm pulling out? 
So I will go, is science the one where, yeah, they have more depression? Yes. Okay, that sounds reasonable, uh, not having seen the article, so mm-hmm. I'll go science. All right, let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. New research confirms that taking an ice bath after an intense workout helps the body build more muscle more quickly. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is bad science. Fuck you. They actually found out it was the opposite. It okay. impairs muscle growth. Now, the reason athletes use this is because it's not it's not just a, you know hearsay or wives' tales. It, it inflammation more. Than, yes, yeah. dramatically reduces soreness and inflammation. Yeah. And so, if you just did two a days, jumping in an ice bath is probably a good thing for you because it's going to allow you to show up tomorrow for the next two a days, and you don't necessarily care about building muscle on those specific moments. Does make sense. I see the NBA players wrapped in ice and they've yes. got to prepare for the next game that's yep. in the near future. Yeah. Well, what's ended up happening, so researchers actually looked into this, and ice slows down your body's processes. So what they wanted to see is what would happen if you used ice baths, would it keep you from gaining muscle mass? Now, there was a bunch of preliminary research that indicated it did, but they wanted to do a real dollars to donuts comparison, and they did it in a really interesting way, which is they had a small sample size, so I'm going to start off with that. They had these guys come in and do regular leg lift workouts, and then they sat for the next like 45 minutes with one leg in cold water and one leg in hot water. And one leg got sweet gains. Yeah, so one was at 46 degrees and one was at 86 degrees. What they found was that Muscle samples taken a few times within five hours of the workout showed that cooled legs generated about 20% fewer muscle repairing proteins than legs in warmer water. And then when they tested them later on, a couple weeks down the line, the difference in protein generated by the cooler and warmer legs was about 12%, meaning they were literally building about 12% more muscle in the warmer leg than the cooler leg, and it was definitive, and it's not like this person has different body chemistry, right? It's like one guy's left leg versus right leg. And they did, by the way, if you were wondering for research design, they did randomize which leg goes in which one. But really, really interesting stuff. So the idea, and it has a causal mechanism, when you slow anything down, you're slowing down the buildings of it. When you build your muscle, what you are doing is ripping that muscle open with extreme weight, and then protein comes and basically fills in those spaces. If you impede that process, which you're doing with this cold, you're literally stopping your body from building muscle at a certain point. Yeah, I've also heard, I can't totally vouch for the veracity of this, but yeah, you need to rip as many muscle fibers as possible and then let your body repair them. With as much protein as possible. Yeah, so you need protein, you need access to fast uh, digesting carbohydrates Uh to replenish your glycogen stores after exercising. And if you, it's, it's sort of not advised if you're going for muscle building to have a lot of vitamins like vitamin C mm. or minerals and stuff because those help prevent damage. Interesting. Uh, and you want the damage. And then like on the days you don't, you haven't just stressed your body and caused all that damage and now your body goes into repair mode and building them stronger. That's when you should get interesting. Your vitamins and stuff. Very interesting. All right, article number two. Startling new research indicates that the South Atlantic humpback whale populations are now at the lowest point in recorded history and are nearing extinction. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is bad science. Thankfully, it's the opposite. Actually, they seem to have rebounded off the edge of extinction thanks to a basically worldwide whaling ban. Now, obviously, we talk a lot about the Russians and the Japanese who don't always follow that. But for the most part, it has dramatically changed whale populations. We know that the Japanese do it for reasons unknown. But like it's more of a cultural thing with them. Do do Russians whale just to like spread misery? Is that? Yeah, probably. No, there was an interesting thing. One of the reasons they whale is actually an incident of bureaucracy, where in the USSR, basically, they had a whale catch number. And in a bureaucracy like the USSR, as the 80s and 90s were going up, it was your job to make sure that number went up because you are trying to provide for the mother Russia. So you have to continue to do this. And they ended up losing a market for the whale meat because nobody was eating it. They couldn't use the blubber. So they were literally killing more and more whales every year and letting the carcasses rot. And it was just out of Soviet bureaucracy. I could see potentially, I mean, I hope the bands are helping even though the Japanese cheat. But yeah, maybe they've they've evolved their migration patterns to avoid <laughs> Japan and Russia. Like that's a possibility. Uh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Or at least just those ones got extinct though. We're in there. But in nineteen in the nineteen fifties, we estimated that South Atlantic humpback whale population to be around four hundred and fifty individuals, and it's now at twenty five thousand. So we're not talking about a small increase. We're talking about a marked rebound of a population with enough genetic diversity because they've actually measured the genetic diversity to ensure that we haven't bottlenecked out and created kind of like an inbred diseased group. That's actually quite a bit of genetic diversity within that group. Do you know if this is unique to this type of whale? Because I felt like I heard something in the news recently about other whales going Good more question. extinct. This is true for, not only for the Southern Atlantic humpback whale, humpback whales more generally, there's 14 known basically groups of humpback whales. In the, Out of those 14, 10 have dramatically increased their numbers over the past 60 or 70 years. So great news for them. 
things like blue whales uh, would be a little bit harder because they're a much larger whale. They have a much longer gestation cycle. It takes longer for those things to pile up. I do think whales in general are doing better. Now, there are things like the minke whale, which aren't even like endangered. So when you talk about whales, you're talking about a wide range of almost nearly extinct to who the fuck cares. It's they're cockroaches of the sea. To the vaquita. Yeah, exactly. To the vaquita, which now we believe there's about 10 of left on Earth. Article number three, a new paper suggests that a potential Alzheimer's medicine found ineffective in clinical trials earlier this year is actually quite effective at delaying the onset of Alzheimer's. Damien thought this was false. Dr. Troy thought this was true. And this one is science and has a super interesting story. It's one of those stories that are a really interesting scientific tale. So the drug is called aducanumab. I know it sounds like I just made that up. I promise it's a real thing. You can go look it up. So what ended up happening is through a lot of fanfare and stuff, remember, we've talked about Alzheimer's. There's very little treatment that you can do for Alzheimer's. You get Alzheimer's, you're just kind of screwed. And so a very little, at least medical treatment we can do for it. Um, you can do a lot of cognitive behavioral stuff. So we had a drug coming out that was theoretically going to help Alzheimer's patients. In trials earlier this year, it came out, we looked at the data and went, ah, it doesn't look like this worked. It was a huge disappointment to the Alzheimer's community who was looking for any tree to grab on, any branch, right? But so they forgot about the experiment anyway. So <laughs> it, was, it was kind of easy to break it to them. Well, what was interesting is this is one of those great science stories. Somebody recently went back and looked at the data. And what they realized was, yes, overall, we didn't see an effect. But what you guys didn't notice, and I noticed as looking at this data, is actually we did see a fairly substantial effect at the highest levels of dosages. So what ended up happening is those highest levels of dosages ended up getting washed out in the average, and it made it look like there was no effect. But if you look back specifically at the high dose patients, there actually was a significant effect that seemed to both delay the onset of it. They declined about 30% on the kind of scale we use to measure people. There was a significant effect when you looked at the high dosages. So it looks like this is actually quite an effective drug. We had deemed it ineffective because we were giving the wrong dosages. And only those people at the very high end of the bell curve started giving activation dosages. Now we need to go back and see if we can give big dosages to people and how big we need. Yeah, human trials are so difficult to glean answers from because we've talked about there are differences in how people respond to the placebo effect. Yes. And there are differences in circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. Like if you had poor sleep the night before, Gender, that Gender, hormones, everything. Yeah. And how you metabolize drugs as well. Like myself personally, I have, and in fact, I have genotype data that shows, oh yeah, you have these mutations that make you metabolize drugs way faster than mm -hmm. other people. So when I've needed to take drugs for medical purposes in the past, I need to have like five times the dose. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, this might kill you. You need to be careful. And I'm like, no, it's just not going to do anything unless I take a high dose. I need more fentanyl, doctor. Trust yes, me. this is how I get my opioids. But, <laughs> I mean, you metabolize it quickly. You're still metabolizing it. You would still be at risk of an overdose or something, right? It's just going through more, more quickly. Yeah, it depends on the mechanism for overdose. So okay. if the breakdown products are detrimental, then that could be a bad thing. But if you need the active molecule around before it gets broken down by your liver to have any sort of effect, like the fact that my body breaks it down much faster than other people yeah. means that I need a higher dose to have the same effect. And other people have these mutations as well. Very interesting. And lastly, article number four, a new review of the literature concludes that taking the birth control pill as a teenager dramatically increases depression rates later in life. Damien thought this was false. Dr. Troy th thought this was true. And this one is both. What? No, that was not an option. <laughs> that you was an option. You can actually look at my uh, my sheet here if you'd like, Damien. So, uh, we, we both got it wrong, I guess. <laughs> we, we, we pro or both got it right. Yes, but which of course means that... Schrodinger's uh, question. Yeah, <laughs> which of course means that Dr. Troy wins again. Congratulations, Dr. Troy. You stopping, Damien. He won before that. You got the last of... one right. You got the last one wrong. Stop bitching about it. No, so... Boycott this show. <laughs> here is why I wanted to bring this up, because this is a really interesting one that we're talking about in terms of science sensationalism. An interesting article came out as a review of the science on this widespread claim. So this starts about less than a year ago, where really randomly, due to a kind of public survey, there people put out the question, like, did you take birth control as a teenager? And then they did some follow-up surveys that were kind of the psychological ones. And they found really startling results in terms of the numbers. So what they found was that self-reported women who had said, we took birth control uh, as a teenager, had much higher rates of depression as an adult. Even those women who had started taking birth control as an adult had higher levels of depression than women who had never taken the pill. And it was fairly statistically significant. I think it was almost double for women who had started early on. And so it became a question of, is it possible that this is causing depression in people later on in life? 
So they had a mechanism of action. They have some evidence that it's going on. But the question becomes, well, wait, one is, wouldn't we have seen this earlier on in data? Why haven't we seen this? And is this a real effect? And the science got broken down. And in the reality is, the reason it is true or false or both is we don't know. Right now, we seem to think that currently there is a possibility that this could happen. We have a mechanism of action. There's some evidence that it could have happened, but we cannot draw out the conflicting factors. So for instance, are people who start the pill earlier more likely to be in a troubled situation? Technically, usually they are. They're starting the pill earlier because they're having sex earlier and that can affect depression rates later on. Also, keep in mind, what do we know about somebody who's gonna go get a pill? At least in the United States, by definition, they are going to a doctor. People who go to a doctor for a pill are also more likely to go to a doctor for depression when they have it. Meaning it might not necessarily see higher rates of depression, just higher rates of people seeking treatment for depression. And just seeing doctors regularly yes. tends to make people depressed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, you know, if you have a problem and you don't have access to a doctor because you, you a poverty or socioeconomic status or, or where you live or whatever, then you're not going to see the doctor. Because universal basic because – well, then, you're, for all yeah, not available then you're not seeing the doctor for the pill and you're likely not going to go see the doctor later for the depression. So, so these things are all interacting. The fact of the matter is we don't know right now. There is reason to be somewhat concerned. And keep in mind, there's other conflicting factors. Like there's multiple types of birth control pill. There's progesterone, there's estrogen and progesterone. Pulling out. P pulling out, right? So all of those things can affect this as well. We need to look at these types of things really carefully because obviously there's a big population of women on the pill. But also remember that there's the null isn't you don't take the pill and then you don't get depressed, right? Because not taking the pill leads to things like childhood pregnancy, which can- Acne. Yeah. Well, and obviously getting pregnant as a kid, a uh, young person can ruin your education and vocational opportunities later in life can really damage your life later on and then will make you more likely to be depressed. So not having a pill might not be a great example, a great thing to do, even if it turns out that pill the pill can increase your risk for depression later on in life, because I guarantee you an unwanted child at 16 will increase your risk for depression later in life as well. To that extent, then there would be- Tons of depressed Latinos, and I refuse to believe <laughs> that my people, we are a happy, festive people. I've seen your hats. All right. <laughs> we can even smile sleeping on a cactus. I'm glad in my last episode of the year I was able to beat down on Damien, as I always do. But yeah, so I don't know when I'll be back on next year. My career is uh, making me a lot more busy. Yes, uh, we have to so damage your career so you come back. That's yeah, the only I'd, way I'd, I'd run for me. I'd run for a rematch too because you know <laughs> yeah. I'm going to beat your ass next I'm also, time you're yeah, here. I'm terrified of facing Damien. <laughs> yes, right, rightly so. He, you know, he knows statistics. Like we said, <laughs> four and a half billion years. At some point, the tennis ball is going through the wall. <laughs> yeah. I'll definitely be back on at some points next year, though. Yeah, uh, Hard to predict when exactly. But in the interim, if anyone wants to see what I'm up to and the talks I give around San Diego and various nerdy things I do. Social media is at uh, DRTROY science. All right. Do you think we can get Dr. Troy's mom in here to fill in for him? Oh, I bet she's she a it. scientist. Yes, she would love it. You she's know what? A archaeologist, classicist. Yeah, uh, I think she would get into fisticuffs with, uh, with, with Bobby, though. <laughs> really? <laughs> but it's all over archaeological she theory. She doesn't like your joke. Oh, yeah. Well, you would quibble about archaeology and your uh, some of your jokes. <laughs> she would be drawn into my sex appeal. Yes, yeah, well. so all, well, all that, of that. Yeah, we have to keep her away from you, Damien. <laughs> all right. Thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction 386, where you learned about why ice baths aren't the best for your muscles. Why the humpback whale population is actually increasing, not decreasing. How a previously debunked Alzheimer's medicine may actually be a very promising medicine for Alzheimer's. And how taking the birth control pill as a teenager may or may not make you depressed as an adult. Thank you so much for joining us and come on back next week for Science Faction 387. I'm sure that's a great new drug for Alzheimer's, but have you considered the natural remedy, laughing and dick? You've been listening to Science Faction. That's not right. <laughs>